good to be here again. And uh, just want to again continue our, uh, what do you call it, our journey through Revelation. And today I want to spend a bit of time, a bit of time in the introduction, then looking at it over our shoulder with the review. Then we'll read the passage. We'll have a look at the when of the seals, the seven seals themselves, the interview, what, the, what is it that stands out, and finish off with the so what. So we've got a fair bit to cover, haven't we? So first of all, let's just see where we're up to with this. I'll go backwards if I can. There we go. The sounds of silence. When you think of the sounds of silence, what do you think of? Simon and Garfunkel. You're going to start whistling it, are you? 1965. That goes back a bit, doesn't it? Apparently, Paul Simon used to enjoy his silence. He used to go into the bathroom in order to think and to compose. Some people might think they need silence after spending time at my place with my family and I. Some people need silence to sleep. Who's like that? I enjoy silence in order to sleep. But then they may make much noise in the sleeping. Huh. Anyone been in a cyclone and you've got the eye of the cyclone going through? I've never been there, but I believe it is very eerie. You've got this, you know... Huge winds, and then you have silence. Silence. And people wait, thinking, is this it? Or is there even more to come? Music. As many of you know, it uses silence called rests to help give impact to the sounds which surround those rests. The sounds of silence. Let's just look over our shoulders. Early in the year, we looked at the story of Abraham, from which the question was asked about movement. He was asked to move. And when I ask it again, are we moving or are we stagnating? Have we learnt something new and fresh about our God? Even since we looked at the story of Abraham five months ago, have you moved? Have I moved? Have we learnt something new and fresh about our God? Have we put him to the test, extending his kingdom of grace? Because if we have dared to move, we would know. We would have even put it, given a blessing to someone as Abraham was called, called to do. Then we commence this journey together through Revelation. We look, first of all, at the beginning of the story, the first part of Revelation 1, written to a people who were weary. And the question was, how is a person, how could a person maintain one's faith while waiting for Jesus to return? How to maintain that edge? Well, looking at that, it's best to become more immersed in his word, to live it out more, to be more daring in our obedience to witness. And we may just have to give up something. So what have you and I given up this year in order to maintain, even to sharpen that edge? So as to trust Jesus completely. After that, we looked at the letters to the seven churches, which started when John saw Jesus, halfway through chapter one. And one of the things that comes out of that is church is not negotiable. So for all you individualists, church ain't negotiable. Church is vital for the disciple of Jesus. However, as a church and as individuals, everything only makes sense in the battle when we bow down and worship Jesus for who he was and is. Only then can we be picked up, encouraged, re-energised and recommissioned. 
And remember, the invitation was given to be part of the upper room at 6 o'clock on Monday mornings. How many of you have actually dared to be part of that? How many of you who could have and haven't? And what about the 24-7 that's coming up? And then there was the question, how well do we weep? John wept greatly because there was no one worthy to bring this planet to its end. Remember Mordecai, Mordecai who wept? And there's a call to come, to come and worship at the throne of our Creator and at the feet of our Redeemer Lamb who was found worthy. And that in worshipping, we are called to go and be lines of grace and righteousness in the dark battle which ranges around us. And so what battle are you and I involved in? outside of ourselves. Perhaps just because we are called to be here at such a time as this, that we are to be engaged in a battle lest we forget. Today, it's the sounds of silence. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Go! And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering, and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Go! And out came another horse, bright red, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the, living, the third living creature say, Go! And I looked, and behold, a black horse. And his rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Go. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O, o sovereign, sovereign Lord, Lord holy, holy and true, how long before you will judge, judge and avenge our blood other, on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island were removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the, the great, great day of their wrath has come, come. And, and who can stand? After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on the earth or sea, or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels 
who had been given power to harm the earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, and 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the holy ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on his throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Thank you so much. That was Revelation chapter 6 and 7 and chapter 8 verse 1. just pray with me please father as we just spend some time immersed in this we don't have much time but please just help us to see the essence just give me your words just give us your ears the ears to hear and to do in jesus name When we think of the when of what we just read, the when of the seven seals, can I suggest it's a bit like a train? There's a departure point. The train leaving after a climatic pause to continue on a journey. And the question which we start off with is who is worthy? Remember the previous chapter. Who's worthy? And the answer was the freshly slain and risen lamb. He alone is worthy to open, to break open these, to break these seven seals and therefore to open this scroll. The point of departure, the beginning of the seals, when Jesus conquered evil at the cross, then ascended into heaven and was, worship, was worshipped as worthy. Can I suggest that is at the beginning of what we're looking at? And thus the future planned at the beginning of time can now be acted upon. The saints can be rescued, sin eradicated and the kingdom to be restored. So then each seal is broken. Is that what the noise of a broken seal is like? No. One after the other. Question. What was the writing about after the seals were broken. We're not told. All seven would have been broken, would have rolled open, but we're not told what the writing was inside and the back. Interesting. 
But nevertheless, when each seal is broken, we have warfare, famine, pestilence, death. These are spoken about in the Old Testament, particularly concerning Israel. These are things which happen to God's people if they were to deliberately and continually break their covenant and live outside of God. Now, these are hardships and woes given to a people, a world in rebellion. Think of the rebellion from Genesis. Think of the cross. A world under the care of its creator, like it or not. And so there's this descent into horror, though limited, where people are called to make that change. They are tasting the fruits of their sinful labour, fruits of its own devising, layer upon layer. And the purpose, like all true discipline parents, is to win back a little reminder of life in the real world. Pain, chaos and death is what these seals have. The first four anyway. Without too much divine protection and intervention. Remember Hosea? Come, he pled. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. Where do the seven seals finish? What's the end point? The train at last arriving at its destination, though I suggest not the final destination, we have this silence in heaven for half an hour. We look at that later. Sometime toward the end. But in between, in between we have the seven seals. Now I did a little bit of a sketch for what it's worth just to sort of remind us what the seven seals are about and this has a laser pointer. This is the first seal the crown, the victor's crown and the bow. You can see that. This is the second one, which is the sword, the red horse with the sword. The third one is the black horse, the scales, the balancing scales, the fourth horse. And the one that followed, the, the being that followed, is death. Then we have the fifth seal when it was broken. We have the souls underneath the altar with the blood crying out. That's sort of red there. Then the sixth seal is chaos uh, with the sun, the stars, the earthquakes, that kind of thing. It's interesting, when you have a look at this, and some of you, as we go through these seals, you may want to look at, say, Mark 13, open your Bibles to Mark 13 or Matthew 24 or Luke 21, and you find that there's a parallel there. Can I also, what I also find interesting is that with these seven seals, they are accumulative. The second horse does not go out when the first one comes back. Does the first horse come back? No. The first horse is continually doing its thing, and then the second horse goes out, and when the fourth horse is going out, guess what's happening? The three previous, three previous horses are out there still doing their thing. It's accumulative. So, let's go to the four horsemen. The white horse and the rider. And I'm not going to go into all the details. I just want to just stand back. We don't have the time apart from anything else. But we just want to stand back and see what we can get out of this. The white horse and the rider was commanded to go by the first living creature. By the way, most translations has the word come. The Greek can either be come or go. And it makes much better sense, I've put to you, that that the, the, the living creature, the first living creature says, go to the horse, as in go out and do your thing. Not saying, not yelling, because it is a loud voice, yelling to John, come and have a look. No, it's go. So he's commanded to go by the first living creature, and the first living creature would seem to be the lion, the one of rulership. And he, the rider has the victor's crown and a bow, conquering, little slight different picture to Jesus conquering. Jesus conquered in chapter 19 with the sword. Or was to conquer with the sword. And so can I suggest here we have a picture of the gospel and its counterfeit going out, conquering. Jesus spoke of both of these. 
Then we had the red horse. The red horse and his rider commanded to go by the next living creature, the ox, representing sacrifice. And he was allowed to take peace from the earth. And he was given a Roman sword, the sacrificial sword, the short sword. And people slaughtered each other. And there was war. Remember, that's what Jesus had in his lineup. Remember, Matthew, Mark, and Luke records Jesus' sermon on last day things, right? Where's John's? He has a whole book of it called Revelation. And so the seven seals is a parallel of this. Man against man, wars and rumours of war. Even while the first is continuing, the first horse is doing his thing, the first rider is doing his thing. When people mess with Jesus rejecting him, even putting him off, and even when following after false Christ and prophets, the claim is that they are then at war. And they are, literally. No peace. Then we have the black horse. And its rider commanded to go out by the living creature with a human face. Somehow signifying wisdom, perhaps. The scales weighed out the basic foods of Palestine. The dries, which were hugely inflated, but the wets were left alone. The dries, just think a litre of wheat. What's a litre of wheat? About that much? A litre of wheat was usually an eighth of a denarii. A denarii was the day's wage of a labourer. Let's say $100. What's an eighth of $100, please? $15? Bag of wheat, $15. Hugely inflated because now it costs $100. How would you like to pay $100 for ordinary wheat? Not organic wheat. Ordinary wheat. Hmm. There was a famine which often followed war, physically and even spiritually, a spiritual famine. Though this is only limited to the dry, basic foods, the oil and the wine were not touched, at least at this time. Then we have the pale horse and its rider, death, and Hades followed the grave, commanded to go out by the flying eagle of justice, the pale horse, the colour of light or sickly green, the word is chloris, from which we get chlorophyll. Uh, that of disease and death. And more is given in Revelation than what Jesus said in Luke 21 when he just mentioned pestilence. Here, the phrases which are used here in this, in this fourth horse are used with the classical covenantal destructions to cause death. We have the sword, which is the long sword, now the long broad sword. We have famine, we have pestilence, and we have wild animals, the four things which occurred to covenant breakers. And the name of the rider? Death. And the grave followed. The fifth seal went was broken. The souls of those who had been slain under the altar, crying out for justice... Slain. When you think of the word slain, we think of the, what happened to the lamb in chapter 5. We also think of the saints in various places where they were slain. Also, the red horse went about slain in this same chapter. And one of the heads of the sea beast was, if it were, slain or slaughtered. It is said that the great prostitute Babylon slew the saints and the prophets. In fact, she caused the slain of more than that. I'm reminded, we're reminded of the blood of the sacrifices which was poured out the base of the Hebrew altar, as well as the earlier story of Abel, son of Adam and Eve, whose, love, whose blood long spilt on the ground, calling out for justice. There will be justice, but not yet. And so we've got a picture of man against the church. Jesus described that earlier as the abomination of desolation standing where it should not. What do you do when that happens? Flee. The church is affected, you see, when man turns against their God and their saviour. Even though the covenantal woes are allowed or poured out for you like, God's people are also affected. Better fill this in. There we go. The saints under the altar. Abomination, persecution, 
Jerusalem surrounded. And then we have the breaking of the sixth seal, when mostly the cosmic elements go wild and out of control, causing great havoc on the earth, as you could imagine. Causing fear because this leads to the day of the one seated upon the throne and of the Lamb Jesus. Nature turns against man and then man comes up against his creator and trembles. No, cries out in fear and shrieks for the rocks to fall. And the enemy, the serpent of old, is laughing all the way to his end. And the question which is left with us is, who is worthy to stand? And then we have the final seal, broken. When it's broken, there's silence in heaven for half an hour. Imagine John seeing this. Imagine John hearing this silence in heaven, experiencing it before writing it down. So he experienced it. And then later he wrote it. Perhaps the silence was because everyone was busy reading the scroll, everyone in heaven. The scroll in heaven rolled open and they were busy reading the scroll which at last is now opened and it's calling for God to act and intervene in the blackness of this world. Perhaps in mourning, Because the actions of God will include execution of so many of his loved ones who refuse to respond to his love and to bend their knees. Perhaps it also includes heaven emptying to come and rescue the saints. I would rather... I would rather that silence be for me rather than against me. A time when heaven, when heaven is emptying to rescue me rather than to execute me? That's what I'd rather. What would you rather? The blackness of death or the whiteness of salvation? And we have the interval. Answering the question, the sixth seal, who can stand? We want to look at more of this next time. And the interval's in two parts as quickly. And given the answer of who can stand, there's a step backwards, if you like. We read of the four angels at the four corners of the earth, north, south, east and west, straining to hold back the four winds of strife Towards the end, we read of a preparing of the saints that are left for these momentous and horribly tumultuous times. And the saints are sealed or marked for their protection because they are owned, they belong to the Lamb. And the concept comes from Ezekiel. Those that were spared, if you read it there in Ezekiel 7, 8 and 9, we have those that are spared those spared that rebelled against the status quo amongst God's people of, mi of mixing the worship and lifestyle of the surrounding nations with their own. And behind that we have the Passover. Remember the Passover? Where anyone who bothered to obey God and painted the top and the sides of the door with the blood of a freshly slain lamb, protecting them thereby from the angel of death. You see, the presumption is that when they are sealed, when the winds are loosed, they're protected. You see, this is the time of the end here. Those that are sealed are alive when Jesus returns. His last day people, 12 is a kingdom number. 
who are described here by the different names of the tribes of Israel. Each name means something. Read about it for yourselves in Genesis 29 and 30. 144,000 who are sealed, who are protected. And then we go to the second interval, the great multitude which John saw, who have come out of the great tribulation, those who did hunger and thirst and burnt with the sun, the ragged army of the Lamb, those that died standing for the gospel, those that never gave up on Jesus. Here are they that stood over time. But what stands out in all of this? Let's just step back a bit more. Imagine the sight. We have joy in heaven, chapter 4 and 5. Then we have anger and pain and death on earth. Then back to heaven with its celebrations. And then we have silence. What does this silence look like? Think of the emotions, the joy and the gladness there in the throne room, in the throne scene there in Revelation in heaven. The joy and the gladness and relief to find that somebody is worthy to break these seals. Then move into this rampant, unstoppable chaos and fear. Then a sense of foreboding with that question, who can stand? Then relief. And adulation, the great multitude. And then this silence. And when we think of the sound, we have this joy, celebration, and structured noise at the beginning when the Lamb is given praise and is worshipped. And then at the end, we have silence. Or should I say, silence. And in between, we have the cries of pain and despair and anger, which eventually moves to praise. So what? What's the point? Well, we can say, don't mess with God. <laughs> Is that fair enough? Don't mess with God. He's bigger than us. What's the point? We can think of justice and mercy. Remember who it was that opened the seal and brought this on? Who was it? The Lamb Jesus. It's the cross which we need to remember. The justice and mercy. It also gives us an explanation of why the mess today, and for that matter, right throughout history, it is because we as humanity are living outside of the covenant. God is allowing evil to increasingly have more power. And I suggest that we here in Australia have no real idea of what that is. We can talk about genetically engineered crops, which is beginning to come in here in Australia. We can talk about the mass control of people as we depend more and more upon cyberspace. Did you know that even here in Australia, nearly all of our teens learn about sex from online porn? Imagine what that does to any relationships. We can talk about gay marriage. Huh. We can talk about the fascination with the spirit world which people have. We can talk about greed-based economies. We're so concerned about investments and about ripping people off through the share market. We're wondering why all this kind of stuff is happening. The covenant, the summary of the covenant, can I suggest, is to return God's love with love from our whole being and to love our neighbours as ourselves. You see, God's love is so strong that it gives in graphic detail the results of living outside of the covenant and living within the covenant. As a stick for those who need it and may respond, as well as a carrot, a comfort to those who are standing up yet growing weary, in that there will be an end. 
And perhaps we are here for such a time as this, to be part of the wounded faithful, that ragged army, perhaps even those sealed. But more importantly, and we're not here to self-focus, to let others know while there is time before the sealing is complete. So the question is, let this be a reality check. Do you, do I need a carrot or a stick? How are we responding? I know for some of us, illness has occurred and is seen as a wake-up call. Some of us may be blithely surviving, surviving family stuff, school stuff, work stuff, God stuff, church stuff. Nah, that's for the pastor and perhaps the elders. You can't get too carried away with it. You can't get too obsessive. Come on. The question still remains, where do I want to be? Where do I want my neighbours to be? What do I need to be so that that can happen? What is it that I need to do as a priority? What do I need to do to be involved in prayer and action? Do we need a carrot? Or a stick. The sounds of silence. I would rather the sounds of silence to be for me and for my family and for the church to which I belong and for my neighbours rather than against. So who among you, that's what I want, who among you wants to face the silence of heaven with joy. Hmm? What are you going to do about it? 